Paul had to say to this little church, we were looking Thursday evening at Romans 16, how that Paul addressed so many of these individually uh, that are a part of this church because they were his kinsmen. Many of them had been saved before Paul got saved. And so that's how we see that Paul was corresponding, no doubt, with these kinfolk of his. And that's how he knew so well what was going on in this church, even though he had never been to the church one time. <laughs> but there's no doubt that's a part of the reason, too, why he wanted to come and see them so badly and minister with them and to them. Because, uh, you know, uh, wouldn't you want to see your saved kinfolk, too, you know, if you had a chance to see them? Amen. And so as he tells them, uh, he's hoping to see them, you know, he's hoping that God will let him finally get through there. But up to this point, God hasn't allowed him to. And so it was very interesting uh, Thursday evening as we looked further <clears throat> into Paul and um, what was going on in this little church in Rome before there ever was a Roman Catholic church. Amen. <laughs> And today we almost spit every time we say the word Rome because the Catholic Church is just so, uh, you know, uh, destroyed whatever good testimony once was there in Rome. Even though I'm sure if we went to Rome today, we could find uh, King James Bible believing street preaching church over on a back alley somewhere, a little storefront someplace, or maybe up in the mountains outside of town in Rome because uh, there's always, uh, you know, even if you ever know the story of Savannah Rola, walking down the streets of Rome, street preaching. And so much the Pope in fear that the Pope ran out of town, scared to death that the Bible-believing Christians might come and skin the Pope alive until finally, you know, he was able to get somebody to assassinate him and kill him. And, uh, but it's very interesting uh, uh, what all's happened in this old great horror city of Rome, amen, over the centuries. As, of course, that one church has got her uh, stranglehold on the, all the nations of the world, like Revelation 17 says. So uh, we're going to read just the verse 18 to 23 today. So let's stand all out, out of respect to the Word of God. And we'll read these six verses here of uh, Revelation, not Revelation, Romans, chapter 1, verse 18 to 23. I'm thinking Revelation already because, again, there's so many things. Uh, where we're living today in anticipation of all these events of Revelation coming to pass real soon. <laughs> Amen. So uh, verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness because that which may be, may, which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of of the, incorrupt, of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible men and to birds and to four-footed beasts and creepy little creeping things. Amen? <laughs> All right, let's pray. Again, Lord, we're thankful for your word. We know it's the truth. And uh, help us to believe it now. And in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. So we're here, we're seeing that sin and con... We're seeing sin and, and God's condemnation of sin and how that the world's uh, got a great need to get right with God. Uh, and clearly God has a case against men because of the wickedness of men, amen, and the godlessness of men. And so, therefore, God has every right to pour out his wrath upon men. Amen. And so that's a whole lot that's going on. And that's why this Bible is all about how in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. Darkness was on the face of the deep. 
the Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters. And the Spirit of God's been moving ever since. And God created the world and He spoke it into existence. And it's, and it's here because He spoke it into existence. And everything has its frequency that it exists on because God spoke this whole world and everything in it into existence. And how here we are abiding as men, but yet men are sinners and they need a Savior. <clears throat> and so God made provisions for us through the person of Jesus Christ. And so our point number one here now then would simply be that men are subjects of God's wrath. Amen? Now we see this clearly if we open up the book of Genesis and start reading through the Bible, we see how man sinned. Adam and Eve were in conspiracy against the Lord and not believing in him and following in line with the lie of the devil. And so the ground was cursed and they were cursed now and they were going to die because now they're sinners. And it didn't take too long, even though it seemed like there was a foot race at the beginning with could men be good enough to somehow be spared the wrath of God and yet it reached a point of Alexis when finally God looked down and man, seeing the whole world was corrupt through them, amen? Speaking of whatever fallen angels there were, they decided to come down in Genesis 6 and mess with the daughters of men. And it repented God that he'd made man, so God was going to have to send his judgment on the whole world and kill everything and everybody and start the whole world over. And yet, uh, when the flood would finally be over, he put a rainbow in the sky and show us that he'll never destroy the world with water again. But the next time there'll be a flood of the world, it'll be by fire. Amen? And every dispensation ends in apostasy. Amen? And so, uh, so we see these pictures here in, of Noah. And how he tried to preach and warn people. 120 years he tried to warn them. They wouldn't listen. They were too busy marrying and giving in marriage and eating and drinking and being merry and, and uh, everything under the sun. Here again you see the homosexuals, the sodomites. They're drinking and they're goofy as all get out and people dancing, making noise. Everybody clamoring about doing their own thing. Nobody listening to the preacher, though, and he's trying to warn them. Amen. Like I say, the coolest thing I think about the ark had to be the pegs that Moses built on the outside of the ark. I believe with all my heart that he had them out there so that the people who believe they could somehow hold on and stay true could hold on and stay true. But nobody held on and stayed true, did they? <laughs> they eventually slipped loose and fell away and were drowned. Men are subject to God's wrath because they're ungodly and wicked. Amen? And because they suppress the truth. Notice what it says here. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. God's against all ungodliness. There's nobody that's slipping by. There's nobody that somehow they're a Rothschild or they're somehow a Rockefeller or something and somehow they're not going to get God's wrath. No, all men are going to face God's wrath. Unless you get into Jesus, the rock, amen, and recognize that the rock can take all the wrath of God, but you've got to escape by getting in that rock. And let the rock take all the abuse so that you don't have to. Amen? So Isaiah tells us about that rock being a place of refuge in the fierceness of the desert in the desert sun. Men are subjects of God's wrath, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Now that word righteousness, what would you say that word righteousness means, JJ? Have you ever heard that word righteousness before? What does it mean? 
righteousness. See? You see the word right and righteousness, right? It means that everything that's right, that's what righteousness is. Righteousness is everything that's right. Amen? The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Men are not righteous. Men don't do things right, do they? They live for themselves. They want to steal from people. They are self-willed. They're selfish. They want to lie and try to protect themselves. They want to tell you lies and half-truths, hoping you listen to the wrong half and get all mistaken in your understanding of what's right. And so men are subjects of God's wrath because they're ungodly and wicked and because they suppress the truth. Now this is an important verse because the new versions, they like to mess with this verse. They don't like this verse. They know this verse is talking about them. People who write new English Bibles write them because they don't hold God's truth as the truth. They say, oh, there's something wrong with that King James Bible. Well, that's funny. My grandma never knew it. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, uh, that's, that's, that's funny. Their great-grandma never knew it. People who speak English thought this book was their Bible for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And yet we're supposed to believe this gas bag because he thinks he's an educated clown and got so many degrees you can call him Dr. Thermometer. No, I'd venture to say probably Dr. For the Thermometer is just trying to sell a book and make a dollar off somebody, some sucker that's willing to buy this new version. Amen? But see, they don't like this verse talking about them because they don't hold the truth as the truth. They say, oh, no. Now, now, if you'll be honest with me, there's some people who really hate your King James Bible. Right. And one of the principal haters of this King James Bible ever since it came out was the Roman Catholic Church. I think it's really interesting because, again, Dr. Ruckman, you know, kind of really taught us as a, as a teenager to really have confidence in our King James Bible. And he taught us a whole lot, and we really do have a lot of confidence in our King James Bible, and uh, thanks to his influence. And yet he warned us so much about the near future when the proof is coming. And he told us about all these Bible truths and how that the truth is coming, about even these UFOs and things, and this coming man of sin that's going to control the world with the name, number, and mark of the beast. And yet in the end, that church hates that book so much because the truth is some of those individuals in that church, they know that book is the truth. Now, never mind. They think they've got every re right to reread it and rewrite it. And they believe that their manisterium is just as important as the book. And they've even taught that that Pope, when he sits in the chair, he's as good as God himself when he's speaking. And yet we know again that these Catholics today got a lot of problems with this new Pope. <laughs> Because he keeps espousing things that they know don't fit what their churches believe for hundreds of years. But I'm just saying the fact that this Catholic church has spent the millions of dollars assisting in making these telescopes over here in Arizona and what they're looking for in space. I mean, here Dr. Ruckman told us about these things and told us how this antichrist false prophet would come and yet this Catholic church is spending millions of dollars and sure enough, they're looking out there in space and they're seeing how everything's coming right on schedule. Because they really don't believe the book, but they do believe the book because they're looking for him to come just like Dr. Ruckman told us that he's coming. Wow. To me, that's just amazing. Because what is it? They hold the truth in unrighteousness. And this is what, if you think about it, when Jesus taught about the unpardonable sin, what were they doing? If you want forgiveness for your sins, and if you want to go to heaven, well, don't be saying, Jesus, you got the wrong spirit. We want nothing to do with you, Jesus. We know you got the spirit of Beelzebub because uh, 
That's where you get your powers, and we don't want nothing to do with you because uh, you're of the devil. Listen, you don't say, Jesus, you're of the devil, when no, Jesus is from heaven. He's God's answer for your sin problem. You start accounting that Jesus, oh, uh, he's definitely not worth your attention. And guess what? You just denied yourself your only hope of ever going to heaven. <laughs> you can't be saved because he's the only way. So don't write him off and don't say that Jesus as the truth. Oh, no, he's t there's too much unrighteousness with him. And it's that's what people say every day. And I'm happy to say that people we know, like Greg McFarland, God bless him. Uh, he's given us his testimony, how there was a time he was living as a young man over here, about 20 years old in Detroit Beach. And uh, man, he'd get high and he'd drink liquor. He'd raise his fist to God and get drunk. Dare God to kill him if there was a God. Bragging, saying he's an atheist, saying there is no God. And here eventually he moves down to Cannonsburg, Kentucky. And gets moved in down there. And one thing leads to another. Next thing you know, he's in church. Next thing you know, he's just walking the aisle. Next thing you know, he got saved. <laughs> and God kept reminding him when God had every right to strike him dead. When he was challenging if God even existed. Because see, he didn't want to acknowledge that God was right. And that God was true. And God was for him. So it was easier for him and so many of the atheists I know. They, if you were to go through their life with them, at some point in their life, they get mad at God. Suddenly it dawns on them that this, this God of the Bible, this God of a miracle, this God of the virgin birth even, well, maybe it's sort of like Santa Claus. It's just all made up. And so they, on purpose, get mad at God over something and write him off. And therefore they happily announce themselves as somehow not even believing, being a believer in God. But the truth is, no, there's something down deep. And they think somehow God's not righteous or God's not fair. He's unrighteous. And they begin to take the truth of God and hold it in unrighteousness. Therefore, they've got every right. They think they're turning their back on it and him. And yet, in the end, he's still there waiting. <laughs> and I know Brother Greg McFarland was sure glad that Jesus was right there welcoming him in with open arms and letting him know he loved him and forgave him. For all that stupidity. And again, like we mentioned earlier about Brother Collins, Brother Greg's one of them fellas, buddy. Brother Greg can love the Lord so much and love him so much because he knows he's got a Bible. And what did this goofball do? Oh, he went from one extreme to the other. Man, he couldn't write enough songs about Jesus. He couldn't go enough places and sing about Jesus. And he sung there in West Virginia and Ohio and Kentucky and all over the tri-state area. Because he loves Jesus now. Jesus has made a big difference in him. And so we're cautioned about people and about translators who would hold the truth in unrighteousness. And so these newer versions say, oh, they just suppress the truth. See? Because there's plenty of people doing the work of the devil trying to suppress the truth. But no, this verse nails them. Amen. Because they hold the truth in unrighteousness. And so they hate God for that. They hate God for verse 25. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creature. Or than the creator, I mean, who is blessed forever. Amen. See, they hate that. Because that's what they do. But this is where, again, we go out of our way to point out to everybody every day how it's these new versions that lie, boys and girls. Don't listen to these lies. They lie and they lie and they lie. The King James Bible has no lies in it. The King James is the only honest to the Greek Bible you'll ever read. It has mansions in it. It has Holy Ghost in it. It's got the importance of the preservation of a Bible. Look at verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. See, 
some people paint God as being this super duper powerful, mean God that just chooses some for heaven and some for hell. But yet they can't account for, well, how, how come this super duper uh, powerful, mean God that chooses some for heaven and some for hell gives man a free will to totally defy him and get in his face and even lift his fist in his face like Greg did. He's awful kind and awful generous, don't you think? He's awful patient, long-suffering. He's sure awful merciful. <laughs> Amen. But oh, these three verses, they must change. See, they must change. Because God's talking about these Bible perverters. And their new translations that are nothing but translations. Amen. And how that man beware of men when they hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because God's righteous and God's right, everything he does is right, including his Bible. And if he writes a Bible, believe you me, he can preserve it. And he can give a Bible to Moses that fits exactly what Moses and his people need at the time in the language they need it in. Just as sure as I speak English, and he gave me a Bible in my time, what Peter calls this, this present truth, amen? And man, I've got it. And he's preserved it for me in a language I can understand. And I'll guarantee you, it's not all it says in Hebrew, but it's what the Hebrews needed for Hebrew. And I don't know Hebrew. I'm just a hillbilly Kentucky hillbilly. But he gave it to me in English so I could get what I need out of it and know what he gave Moses enough to have it right exactly the way I'm supposed to have it. Then we see men reject that within them because God has shown them if they'll just look around their environment a little bit, look around at the creation that God made, they clearly see there had to be a creator to make it. That's why I love these guys like Gary Bates and these men that have all these creation ministries because a lot of these guys uh, have got all kinds of scientists, men working for them, men with PhDs and all these sciences, and they can see clearly how, yes, all the real facts of science point to the fact that God is real in the Bible's right. And so men reject that, that within them, their conscience and even their thoughts, because they have questions and they have to face life's questions every day. Should I yes do it? Should I no do it? What should I do? And so you will make your choices, won't you? And men choose to reject, amen, what God tells them is right. And they choose to do what's wrong, amen. Therefore, that's why they're going to face the wrath of God someday. Just as sure as they faced it in the time of Noah, we're going to face it every day of our life until the judgment. And he's coming back soon, and the whole world's going to face him one of these days and face the destruction that comes with his second advent. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. Now, the closest thing I could prove to you anything would be Ed, and I'm sure he'd be the first to admit he's a little rusty. But being a biology major, like I was sharing with him some things, it's just so amazing how every day, if you read after these men of science that keep finding the Bible true all the time. See, you got to pity poor old Darwin. Poor old Darwin, he did the best he could. Let's face it, he looks like a Cro-Magnon man himself. He don't look very intelligent. He don't look like a modern man at all. He kind of looks like the missing link, to be honest. Uh, and so he thought pretty well like the missing link. You know, the best you can do. You know, he was just thinking off the top of his head based on what his grandpa taught him. And so uh, it made sense to him. I mean, he looked at something called a simple cell. It looked pretty simple. You know, there's just a simple, there's a little old amoeba there. So, but yet, uh, there's no such thing as a simple cell. And that's why even major scientists are definitely abandoning poor old <laughs> Darwin left and right because we've got so many great means of zooming in on a single cell and what goes on in a single cell that uh, <laughs> poor little old Darwin, when he was talking about some simple celled creature maybe evolving up to a multi-complex celled creature, we all know today, if we're honest, that Darwin didn't have a clue what he was talking about. Again, he was just going by what he could observe back there in the 1800s. But believe me, he was totally wrong. 
he was just as wrong as the clown that said, oh, surely the tides are proof that the world's spinning because all of a sudden we have high tide and then there's low tide. Well, you'd expect that if the world's spinning because as it's spinning, you know, we're going to get a high tide once in a while and it's got to wash back to the other way. And, of course, we know that's totally wrong. No, the reason there's tides is because of the moon. Because <laughs> the gravitational pull of the moon. And uh, so, hallelujah, we can look at a cell today and guess what we discover a cell is? A single cell, even in your body. You have individual cells and you're quite a complex creature because you have a lot of different kinds of cells in your body and they all work together. <laughs> Amazing. And yet every single cell in your body is what? Is the little uh, yellow hat man walking around in town out there? Is it the little man out there that's jumping off the garbage truck, picking up the garbage, throwing it in the garbage truck? No, no, no. Every cell of your body is a whole city. You can't have a city without streets. You can't streets without, have streets without a garbage man to pick up the garbage and put it in the garbage truck and carry it somewhere and dump it somewhere and have gasoline to put in the tank of the truck to move it. And you got to have somebody take the garbage out and all the complexity of what a city is, including traffic, is what your cells are. <laughs> and there's machines going around and repairing other little machines in your town and in your cell. And everyone has its function. Everything has its job. And it does it. And it's very complex. And if something goes wrong, buddy, your whole body ends up finding out about it later on. <laughs> and you get in a heap of trouble. It's amazing. Never mind what the DNA sequences are saying and what it shows us. And even they've discovered in recent days even uh, what the junk DNA is for, and it's not junk. <laughs> so it's like the Bible says, yes, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. I can take a single cell of your body and show you God. If you want to study into a single cell of your body, what's your skin cells for? What's those cells in your blood carrying stuff back and around for? What's every cell of your body doing? And every cell being its own little individual city working with these other cities and in town. And here you are walking around as a giant state of some kind. <laughs> I don't know what state you're in, but anyhow. Paul said, I'm, I've learned to be content, though, whatever state I've been in. Whether I'm in Michigan or Texas, it don't matter. So... Hallelujah. Look at uh, Romans 2 and verse 15. Romans 2, 15. Which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. See, God's given you a conscience. And even, maybe it's been a long time, but there was a time when you were little and you first learned what sin was and you kind of knew right from wrong. And boy, when you heard those curse words or you even started saying some curse words, you knew it was wrong. And it was a part of you that wanted to blush because there was a part of you that said, oh man, I've been taught by mom, I'm on dad better. If they heard me, I'd be in trouble. Amen? Now again, the trouble with the conscience is it can become seared like a hot iron can, seal, can, can sear flesh until pretty soon you don't feel it no more. But that conscience was once sensitive and soft. And your thoughts once accused you or excused you. And if you lie against your conscience, man, you're sinning against God. Because that conscience is there to tell you what's right and what's wrong. And how you're to say yes to God and no to the devil. Amen. And the world and the flesh. So God's given in every man that conscience and that man will stand on the day of judgment for God and give an account. But if you be honest with what conscience God gave you, you know there's a God. Because how could you have that knowledge of right from wrong even if God had it put, it put it in you from the beginning and you haven't inherited that all the way back from Adam when he was told, don't you go to that tree there and eat that tree. <laughs> And boy, he did violate what God told him to do. Amen? And so we know what sin is, that's for sure. And so we see, thirdly, men reject God's evidence in our environment, the signs of his creation. 
for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. You can't look out in outer space and just look around you. Psalm 19. Don't you wonder why the stars are in the sky? They're telling you and I of the glory of God. Amen. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his hand. They were day unto day utter speech. Night unto night showeth knowledge. There's no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth. We know there's a God. Anybody that knows how to look up can see all that expanse and say, man, there's got to be a God. But what does it all mean? Why are those stars twinkling? What do those twinkles in those stars mean? Why did God put that all out there? To make us feel real small? Because, boy, we sure feel small when we look up there at it. And yet, when you honestly look at it and look at what it is and how that... Uh, the red shift of the star shows it's all leaving us. It's all moving away from us. And the truth is, it's leaving us faster today than it was tomorrow. It's the further reaches of space, those things as they fly away from us, they're going even faster to the things that are closer to us as moving. Everything's moving, moving further and further away. Because again, it's only been here 7,000 years. 6,000 years about, really. About 6,000 years is all it's been here. And that stuff's way out there on the edges. It's moving so fast that, man, it blows the astronomer's mind to think that we can even see light from that far away. Because they don't have all the answers. They're still trying to figure it out. And mind you, they're trying, but the truth is they haven't even been to the bottom of the ocean to see what all's down there yet. Because there's so much ocean, they ain't been to every place yet. They don't even know all the creatures and critters that are down in the earth, let alone the, the water. And they keep finding new stuff all the time. They keep finding new cities under the water all the time. And that slows them down. Then they get to get sidetracked looking at all this stuff and wondering how it got here. And when did it get here? And how come they build it down underneath the water? And how could it be under the water? Well, obviously at one time, there was no rain on the world. And there wasn't all this ocean and stuff that there is now. But see, you get all those answers from the Bible. They don't want you to read your Bible. They don't want you to know it's in the Bible. So that's why we have the answers. Let's share it with people. Amen? Amen. We see God's eternal power and nature are clearly seen in his creation because the Bible says that, yes, if you could study creation enough, pretty soon you'll figure out For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So that they are without excuse. Now, does God have power? I'm sure I could get anybody on the street to even probably say, of course God has power. Well, no, I'm not, I'm not going to ask you that. I'm going to ask you, does God have eternal power? Well, now we're, now we're touching something, see. Now we've gotten into something. It's not too hard to believe that once upon a time, God took a little old ball and put it on the table and spun it. It don't take too much to believe that, but that takes some power, no doubt, amen? But eternal power? Oh, no, I'm not going to say that. I'm going to say God took the ball, set it on the table, and he's now moving the whole room around it. And he's been doing that ever since he started. <laughs> Does God have eternal power? If you could study creation enough pretty soon, like Dr. Bao, I believe we'd all agree that yes, God has eternal power. And it's nothing for God to have that sun going around this earth every day. And then the planets going around the sun as it goes around the earth every day. Because that shows God's eternal power. And if you studied it enough, you'd even see how that, that shows you God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Ghost. Because again, thanks to science, we can even analyze, uh, could we even be around if there wasn't a sun? And the th three different rays coming off that sun, we could see the light of the sun, but... but Besides the light of the sun, there's a couple other rays there. There's 
there's a, you know, a violet ray, ultraviolet ray, and then there's an actinic ray. There's three different rays of the sun, and we couldn't be alive. Nothing on the planet could be alive hardly without those rays of the sun. If we studied this stuff long enough, we'd figure out not only does God have eternal power, but he's even a Godhead of a Father and a Son and a Holy Ghost. <laughs> Amen? Because even though these things are invisible, Paul said that these invisible things are clearly seen. Now it's funny because the Bible says, well now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And without faith it's impossible to please God, for he that cometh to God must first believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. But I'm saying these are not such extreme postulations, you know, postulations to believe, because again, if you study what you can't see in the creation that he has made clearly that can be seen, you'd know the eternal power of God and the Godhead. Amen? Even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. A man knows there's a God. He knows he's got every right to be judged by that God. And he's going to be judged someday. And God's going to have every right to pour his wrath down on that man for all of his unrighteous and unwicked deeds that he's done. Unless he comes to that God begging in mercy. Amen. Looking for grace and forgiveness. And of course, the great thing is our God is a merciful, grace, great and kind God that he will forgive. He offers forgiveness, but he will by no means clear the guilty. He'll make sure his son takes care of that for us if we'll believe on him. Amen. And so number four, we see that, yes, men do not honor God nor give thanks. I like this. God gave us 86,400 seconds in a day. Have you used one to say thank you? Amen. When we get to where we can't be thankful for what God's given us, our breath, our existence, our little bit of vapor on this piece of glass that we're here for our little while, and then we're vanished away. If we can't thank God for it for just one second out of a day, I mean, 84,000, 400 seconds in a day is quite a few, wouldn't you say? But sometimes we just get so caught up, man, we got to play that game. Oh, i got to go eat. Oops, i got to use the bathroom. Oops. That pretty, pretty soon. <laughs> Our day would change a little bit, too, because we'd be reminded of how awesome God is. And how the truth is, boy, we can't live without him. Amen. And we need to be thankful. We have, I know other moms and dads, and uh, they're running to the hospital. Uh, their boys and girls don't have five fingers. Their boys and girls don't have arms and feet. Some of them are blind. Some of them don't have no food. Some of them are riddled with disease. Men do not honor God nor give thanks. Amen. Verse 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. See, there's usually a point there where all of a sudden they just turn in rebellion toward God and leave God, abandon him, turn their back on him, believe the lies of the devil and go the devil's way. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. See? See, when Satan said to Eve, Yea, hath God said, he got her imagination going. He got her in her mind to doubt if what God said was really true or not. Well, I think I could touch this thing all day and it wouldn't hurt me. Well, it looks kind of like it would be, I think it would make me wise if I went ahead and ate this thing, Eve thought to herself. To where finally she took a bite and said, well, man, this ain't bad. This ain't bad. Tastes pretty good. She thought, and so she said, man, I'll share this with my husband. He didn't deny it. He accepted it, didn't he? Okay. Verse 
What was Adam and Eve's problem? When Satan said, hey, oh no, no, don't listen to God. You're not going to die. In fact, you'll be like God. You're no good from evil. See, they weren't thankful for what God had done for them, what God had provided for them. Amen? Amen. They became vain and full of themselves and their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. And professing themselves to be wise, well, we'll go ahead and take it, see if it's what God says or what the devil says. Let's go ahead and see if the devil ain't right. Boy, they got themselves in trouble. They became fools. Amen? <laughs> Amen? And so people keep falling for the same lies of the devil today. <clears throat> they keep turning away from the Lord. They let their imagination get away from them. They, they go by what all this crap they see on television. It gets their imagination going. Well, maybe God is just an alien that came down from outer space. Are you nuts? <laughs> and so, as usual... Since it's all about them and how good looking they are and how important they are and how much a God they are. Amen. But no, it's all futile. It's all empty. <laughs> Listen, you're, you're the clay and he's the potter. You have no means of making anything and being anything. God's the creator. You're the clay. And so sure enough, their imaginations were vain and their hearts are darkened. And so it's only understandable then that men become prideful and turn away from God. And but pretty soon they're trying to they're trying to pretend they can satisfy that missing part of God in their life by finding it in the things of the world, like another man. Well, maybe I should make him my holy papa, and he can intercede for me. And he knows I'm not that bad. I'm, I'm really, I'm trying to be good, and I'll give him all the money he wants, and I'll really build his church for him, and he'll forgive me. He'll be my two-bit priest, and I can go to him for forgiveness. He'll, he'll give me forgiveness. And so we look to another man, try to find God in another man or another woman. <laughs> or maybe a bird or a four-footed beast or some other creeping thing. And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image. Now notice this too, how that the very thing that God tried to warn Israel about, making images and having images, is what God always attacks because for some reason we're hung up on it. We wouldn't be where we are today in sin if it wasn't for television and having an image. If all we had was radio, we wouldn't be where we're at today. But see, we need an image. It ain't enough to hear something. Though the Bible says faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. That's certainly enough for God. But when it comes to the devil, though, he knows you need an image. you got to have something to look at. So they call it television. <laughs> Amen. And you see these little images on a screen, you know, and, and it gets to you. It gets to you. I've, I've heard about this film uh, that's, that came out at the movies a while back. And it was called The Shack. And, and people were, it was stirring up quite a controversy because, uh, and rightfully so, because, you know, the writer of this book, The Shack, uh, is very perceptive of understanding uh, human nature and where people are and especially people that have had a lot of tragedy in their life and how they deal with the tragedy. So the truth is the man wrote a masterpiece of a book called The Shack. And uh, now it's not showing a proper biblical 
model of what God is and what his son is and what the Holy Spirit is by any means. But as far as showing how that the truth is God is interested in who you are as an emotional being in all of your life, that closet of your life, all that stuff you got shoved in there that you don't want nobody to know about, he knows all about that too. And it did a really excellent job of showing you that, man, listen, you can't hide from God. God knows you inside and out. God knows you better than you know yourself. And you do well to trust him. Now, I believe that's probably all the guy had in mind. And that's what he tried to portray. But, of course, people have gone to see it on him because in the movie, well, he's got God showing up like a woman. Talking to this guy like a woman. Well, there's sometimes that God can come to us like a woman. Because, you know, like a mother can't, uh, she may forget her sucking child, but God will never forget you. You know, God's more faithful than a woman. <laughs> and in the movie that they have of this shack, they show God. Uh, finally, this, this man, he, God feels like he's ready to need a father. So then God shows, makes an appearance to him like a man. Because they say, well, he's going to need a man for, 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 his, for his God to see him as a man today. You don't need to see him as a woman. Which, again, we understand the point that's being made, that God is God, you know. And God is so much more than just a man or just a woman. Oh, amen, that's a fact. <laughs> so in some ways, I think it's kind of good because it's going to force people to have to deal with some of those issues. But if you get into the storyline of what the story's about, I think that the guy did a great job of helping pull you in because, buddy, in this story, this man loses his little girl. A man loses his little girl. And some crazy man somewhere supposedly killed her. And they never do find who did it or anything. So as soon as a friend at work told me I should watch this movie and I started watching it, I said to myself, oh, this is the kind of movie I hate those kind of movies because they force you to have to look at real life and real life is hard believe me I know a lot about real life I don't need really to be told about it again <laughs> and, and I learned this as a little boy I wasn't no bigger than JJ probably a little smaller and if you ever watched a movie called Willis and it was a Willis Berry and it was that movie called The Champ black and white movie. If you've never seen it, you go watch it tonight, today, quick as you can find it. Get a hold of it and watch it. And I'm telling you, as a little boy like J.J., I watched that movie on an old black and white television when I was a kid. And buddy, I had to sit there and, on that, and watch that television, and I was crying. Because I was a little Jackie there, and the champ was dead. And the champ looked so much like my own papa that Man, I, I, I didn't want to see him die. Come on, champ, get up off the mat. You, you know, you're not dead. You know, because he loved that old boxing man. You know, he loved that old man. That old man was his life, and he loved that old man. And that old man died. And right there, I learned there's some movies I can't watch because I guess get too much emotionally involved. And there's too much to pay <laughs> emotionally. And when I started watching Shaq a few days ago, I said, man, I, this is the kind of movie I hate. But when I saw that lady at work, I said, oh, I, I started watching that movie a little bit. And I'm going to finish it. I'm going to go back and watch it. Because she wanted me to watch it. Now, I know a lot about this lady's life. I know what she's been through as a child. And she's, I praise God, she got saved a few years ago. And believe me, it's a wonder, she's got a wonderful testimony. Because I know what her mom did to her when she's little and stuff. And man, it's, it's by the grace of God she saved. And, and I love this gal. She's a great gal. Is a, you know, a fellow employee with me. And so I made myself watch it. And I'm glad I did. Because again, I was so tied in there. Because wow. We want, if we, do, if we deny the God of the Bible, then pretty soon we make things our God. Because we've got to have a God. We've got an empty part of a puzzle piece missing. 
And so men are happy to carve an image. Amen? Since God is everywhere and in all things, well, I'll use this as an aid to worship the Catholic Church. Tries to say that she don't have any idols, and yet we know, oh no, they're all idols. Because they're all images of different saints. And so they pray to these different saints. And they make up goofy ideas about, well, uh, we're just praying and being reminded of this saint. And we're praying, asking that saint up in heaven to help us pray to God to get what we want uh, from God as our aids to worship. We're not really praying to St. Thomas. We're not really praying to St. Joseph. We're not really praying to Mary. But we're going to use her image as an aid in our worship of the true God. And, and so they make their excuses to violate the commandment when God says, don't make no images. See? And yet people have to have an image. Because they're worshiping things. They don't worship a God that's the creator God that's invisible and spiritual. Amen? And so we've got American Idol. And we've got all these idols from Hollywood. <laughs> And men give their time, talent, and treasure to all these things that they possess. Amen? And professing themselves to be wise. This is where we get the word a professor. And some man says, oh, well, I'm a professor. It's interesting that no one, in, uh, no one ever called themselves a professor. College professors of the evolutionary theory glorify their education and scholarship. And that's a word that People were called teachers in the school. People went to teaching schools and to uh, agricultural schools. But once Darwin's theory got going, then men began to call themselves professors. And professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And swallow this evolutionary junk <laughs> and honestly think they're intelligent. And think you're stupid if you don't believe it. And they change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like two corruptible man and two birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. And so that even today, modern men are studying the Bible and they're saying, well, we're trying to put this together. There's no denying that some of these people who wrote the Bible wrote profound, deep, wonderful things that no normal man could know, but we don't want to admit there's a creator God that gave it to him. Oh, well, maybe an alien from outer space put that in him. And then we got to start studying these aliens from outer space. And so, well, some look like this and some look like that and some like are creeping things or some are like men and some of them are like four-footed beasts and even a mothman. Now that makes more sense. That somebody like that <laughs> could come down here and give this to somebody. And someday somebody will come down and he'll have holes in his hands. And when it lands over at the Vatican and he steps out, oh, the whole world will go this way. <laughs> you goofball. Boy, we're right on schedule, don't you think? Men in their pride, they can't acknowledge that God is just what he said the way he said it. Well, let me give you a better version of that. <laughs> <laughs> nope, I think I've got all I need right here. Let's all stand and bow our heads in prayer. Now, Lord, again, thank you for this reminder of how godless and wicked and unrighteous we are. And how rightfully we are in deserving your judgment and wrath. And how that, Lord, you told us clearly in John chapter 3 that, yes, if we believe, we'll not be condemned. But we're condemned because we won't believe on the name of the only begotten Son of God. And so rightfully, Lord, uh, we deserve your condemnation. We're glad that. Most of us here today have believed on Jesus as our Savior. If someone's listening, Lord, they've never been born again, never been saved. Help them to come to know you as their Savior so that, again, uh, they can know the, their God that is their creator 
and walk with you in true fellowship as your sons and daughters. And in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen.